shift over to Simon of uh, Clara. And uh, Simon, are you there? Yes, I am. All right, I can't see you. Let me see. Did you talk again? Yeah, I can. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Oh, All right, okay. Simon, thank you for being here. Okay, so you represent the tech bucket of the Zeitgeist Four Buckets of Change. And uh, I am really excited that you're here. And I know a lot of people are as well, because in a time where so many of us are struggling to uh, survive during this crisis, and you know everything about what's successful is about big tech companies, right? You are an emerging company uh, that started right in 2013, uh, mm -hmm. and you know you are actually a, a great success story. And you're in the world of telemedicine, and those of us who are home right now are really experiencing how what you do is impacting our lives right now. And I think it would be interesting for everybody to know uh, how uh, we're gonna be experiencing medicine moving forward. So uh, Simon, thank you for being here. And thank you. Uh, I don't know, let's start. So Simon, you started this company in 2013. You didn't know that we were gonna have a coronavirus outbreak or COVID-19. Right, you you weren't planning this. You didn't you didn't bioengineer this so that you could uh, make your company well positioned for success. No. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, like, the reason why I'm saying that is like last week we had Franklin Leonard, who's in the movie business, who who said that he had a conversation that Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, actually uh, uh, they thought that he bioengineered it. As you know, Netflix is doing super well as well. So uh, you started this company in 2013, right? So mm -hmm. why did you? do it where what was the opportunity space that you saw back in 2013 sure like it's very simple um i come from a family full of doctors so i you know the minute i had a smartphone when i was a kid and or a teenager to be honest um i already started communicating with my family via my smartphone and you know when i had a rash i sent it to my mother when i had something else i sent it to somebody else so kind of, I grew up with, you know, technology emerging, having an iPhone, and then suddenly I started using it very naturally um, uh, with my family, especially when I was a student, I lived away. I didn't want to go to anyone else than my family. So uh, I had a conversation with my mother or a video call, or um, I sent them a picture. I went to the pharmacy and then, you know, I'm still alive. So, which is, which is great. Um, so that's kind of, um, you know, all my friends were jealous because they always had to, you know, do an appointment and then go to the doctor, wait in the waiting room and do fill out the annoying paperwork, mm -hmm. then, you know, waiting on hold and all that kind of stuff. And then, so I, um, uh, I also worked in a hospital when I was very young with my father. Um, so the first part is kind of understanding the patient experience and then right. like working in a hospital was also like a big kind of revelation for me. So you realize that there were like deficiencies in the healthcare system back then. We all know that and we're seeing it now, right? So yeah. what would you say were like the top few deficiencies that inspired you to say, okay, we should be doing this remotely through telemedicine? Well, at, first of all, like the patient is not in the center of the care, uh, which they should be. Right. It's all about like the insurance companies uh, requiring the doctors and the administrative staff to do certain things. And a lot of time is just wasted on administrative um, tasks and paperwork. And they do stuff over and over again, um, which results in phone tagging, uh, patient questionnaires, all this annoying stuff. It's, it's just very, very complicated. And then you look in other industries and you see like everything is powered by tech. Why can it not be just as simple as that? So that was kind of the big, big uh, driver. And then also looking at like what patients are saying, you know, patients are like 96% of all patient complaints are related to poor communication or service. And only 4% are related to um, the actual care. So you understand that this is the problem and that's what we are solving at Clara. Uh huh. And how popular was telemedicine before the coronavirus? To be honest, like 
it was always just uh, something that people talked about and some a couple of practices were doing it you had teledoc which is a public company right. then doctor on demand um which was a rising company or is a rising company but it never really had a breakthrough because the incentivization of doctors to do telemedicine visits is is not there they just get way more money when the patient go, comes into the practice. And so why would they do that? What's the incentive for the doctor? They always say like, oh, great. Yeah, mm, I think I need to see in person. And then that's how they get the money. Uh huh. And so you're saying that like you just said, have the doctors get money. Were they reluctant to do this in the United States because uh, they weren't paying, they weren't going to get as much money from the insurance companies or they couldn't charge as much? That's what, for me, that's the number one driver, number one driver, because um, uh, right now you see it, um, now they lifted all regulations. I mean, there's also this state regulations that you cannot treat a, in some states, a patient that is not based in your states and you need to be licensed and cert certified. So there's a lot of regulation that also puts kind of a barrier into making this more mainstream. But the number one barrier for me is uh, reimbursement. Uh -huh. And so now we're in this moment where all of us, right, if they need medical care, and it's like one of the things I've always talk about, like, what about all the people who need medical attention that aren't affected by COVID, right? So, you know, what is what does that mean for uh, medicine right now? I mean, you know, are people just connecting with their doctors over this? Like, you know, maybe there's not a lot of elective surgery. Maybe uh, people don't need to go to the dermatologist and get Botox or whatever. Uh, but uh, how is uh, telemedicine being used right now? I think that's the biggest um, kind of driver for telemedicine right now that, you know, patients can still receive their care without needing to go to the doctor's office, which they can't in most cases. That's one factor. So if you don't have COVID, um, kind of what are your options? All the practices are closed. You're not allowed to go there. Um, and the, so the only option goes to telemedicine. So doing like either sending a picture and answering some questions or doing a video call, et cetera. Um, but you ha also have to understand that telemedicine, people think it's just a video call when we talk about telemedicine. Yeah, I want to know what exactly is telemedicine besides what we think it is? <laughs> so telemedicine, people, like it's kind of a loose term, right? So, um, or loose concept. So people understand it differently. Most people think it's just a video call. Uh, I think, and uh, uh, we at Clara think it's much more than that, right? It should co cover all aspects of the patient journey and should, it should actually seamlessly integrate with the in-person encounter. So what does that mean? Every patient needs to show kind of their insurance card, needs to fill out paperwork, needs to schedule an appointment, all that kind of stuff. And this can be done virtually, right? It doesn't matter if the patient comes in to the um, practice in person or whether the, the visit is, is virtually done. The other part is like what happens after the visit? You know, when you just have a video call, you still need to follow up with the patient and see like if there are any side effects or if the patient is, if the treatment is actually working. And so all of this kind of stuff needs to be one holistic approach and it cannot be like a point solution that is isolated from the rest of the care process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, I'm actually showing uh, some pieces of your website. And this is another thing, you actually sent this to me, right? So here's an example of uh, how telemedicine, <laughs> sorry to gross everybody out, but right, you just put the cell phone and like a doctor could basically just look right down your throat, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, this is awesome. not from our platform, I just gotta, yeah. <laughs> This is not from our platform, so I just got to say that um, we don't <laughs> share any, our, all of our data. That's my, do you know that's my, is it called an epiglottis? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I'm a PhD, so I'm not a medical doctor, so um, <laughs> you should always ask someone else. Um, but uh, yeah, this is, this is, this is what, ha what happens. Like the cameras are getting better, you know, the video quality is getting much better. And obviously, Telemedicine cannot cover everything. Like that's the most important part. There is still like a component where you need to go to the practice. And that's why, again, like I, I kind of repeat myself, it's you cannot just have, think about telemedicine as a video call solution. 
and you cannot think about it being isolated from the brick and water or the, the, the current processes, medical processes. So it needs to be integrated in the current workflows where, you know, at a certain point you need to touch the patient, you need to take a biopsy, you need, you know, operate a patient. That uh, can be done maybe via the Da Vinci robot, but um, up until now, this is, this is still um, requires an in-person visit. Right, but that's where it's going, right? I mean, I've been reading a lot about 5G technology and how we're going to have like remote robots, right? So like, yeah. did you, should you buy like a robotic com 5G company maybe and then you'll be really powerful? Well, let's, uh, sh you know, because I don't think many of us on here, I think there are a few uh, who are in the medical community and obviously we're all consumers of needing medical attention, right? So uh, my question to you is, most of us are on there because I have the data, uh, are in consumer facing businesses, right? Marketing, retail, uh, entertainment, media. Um, so what do you think we can learn from you in terms of uh, the success of telemedicine? Like, you know, many of us are challenged right now in these other industries. You know, could you teach us something on how, uh, you know, we can apply what you're learning through your success? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. I think there, you need to just adapt super quickly uh, in this current environment. So what we did, for example, for us, telemedicine wasn't the big use case. We had it in our platform, but nobody cared about it because, as I said, um, you know, uh, the incentivation for doctors wasn't there. They mainly used our platform for doing digital intake, scheduling, follow-up questions, everything powered by messaging, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that you don't have to do this in the office anymore. So we made that process super simple. Um, but as soon as this COVID crisis hit, we realized this is the time where video calls become extremely important. So what our development team did is we, we always put video calls in the back burner. So our company just developed video calls very, very quickly. Our engineers did an amazing job. So all the kudos goes to them. Um, they, they just did an, a fantastic job. And um, then we adjusted our messaging on the website. We provided the service to our, or the solution to our customers. And we helped our customers to still basically have a business. Because, you know, if you cannot see patients anymore, you don't have revenue, you cannot pay your employees, you can, it's over basically, right? And with this solution, we could help practices still uh, stay in business plus patients still receive um, care and so kind of what maybe what the learning is and I, I'm not saying that we are a teacher by any means but the learning definitely here is pivot very very quickly when this macroeconomic or macro changes happen you need to uh, adjust accordingly just I, I think that the companies that don't move fast enough Mm -hmm. They are going to be the losers. They are going to uh, be coming out of this um, situation very, very difficult. Um, so yeah, that's that's really important. You also can learn it from Zoom. Zoom didn't care about telemedicine in the beginning, and suddenly everything is about telemedicine. That's kind of you know Zoom and telemedicine is one thing. They didn't offer anything, and suddenly at their landing page, they were recognized as a as a provider for that space. So yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, another thing that I think is really important is kind of like looking forward is um, we are kind of adjusting on a week by week basis. We're not staying the same every week. We could almost adjust our messaging every week, uh -huh. you know, because uh -huh. the messaging to whom? To, to our customers, right? Um, so like you have to understand like a couple of weeks ago, people cared about, hey, telemedicine. I need it, you know, like emergency buying uh, customers. Then suddenly, oh, uh, what is the best solution out there? That kind of was then the mo top of mind, right? right? First, they cared about just having anything. Then they wanted to have the best thing. And now they're figuring out how do we get back into our office and how does our reality look like going forward? That's, which is basically your topic. Practices think the same way. How's it gonna be? Like, are patients going to come in? How important is telemedicine? So in that part, you need to be kind of a thought leader and write a step-by-step -step guide how this affects your customers and how they can go forward in, in, in kind of maneuvering through that crisis.
Yeah, the big trend in all of our businesses and all our companies was like customer experience was the most important thing, right? And now we're seeing it as well, right? If we're going to survive after that. And it seems like what you're doing, you're really putting the customer in the center and then working backwards, which, you know, we have like one trillion, you know, wasted dollars in healthcare in, in America, uh, and, you know, so I'm wondering if this is actually going to be a solution to that big problem. We're seeing it right now. Yeah, I totally believe it. I always believed it. I think that's kind of the nature why we built what we built. We think healthcare is a service. Part of the service is the uh, procedure and the surgery and the rest of it is communication. And that requires the biggest transformation. And technology is going to uh, make enable this. So like the other learning is go digital, go remote. Um, I think that we see this very much happening in for my business personally, we're all remote. It's, it works very, very good. I think our employees will, they are already embracing it. So that's something you have to deal uh, with also from a completely different angle that I think don't, I don't think employees will just go back. Um, and then, you know, you need to kind of have a digital angle in your company. Like if I look at our practices, the practices that will adapt digital or like will build the virtual arm to their practice, their clinic or the hospital mm. and um, will have, will be ready for this. These are the ones who are going to be the winners. The other people who are not able to transform and move with the market, they're going to be the um, probably left behind. Right, right. It's definitely a theme that we've been talking about and how, you know, this situation is catalyzing or accelerating, you know, technological uh, ways of working. Um, so I have like a couple more questions and then I have an activity that I want everybody to be involved with. It's going to be really fun uh, because you're a perfect example of a company that has been really primed uh, to succeed in terms of a crisis uh, because of, you know, the, the zeitgeist that we're living right now. So the first question I have, um, so many people do go into medicine, right? So because, you know, it's a pretty lucrative career um, and, you know, people, doctors have been very, uh, I guess, challenged by insurance and all that. And there are many doctors who don't take insurance. So number one, you know, how, I mean, how are doctors going to feel about telemedicine uh, giving them less money for their services? Yeah, they're going to hate it. Um, to be quite simple, like, um, I think they, if they, that's the first reaction. If you get less money, you feel kind of not great about this. Yeah. I think the doctors that, um, are going to work the right way with it. The people who are going to love it is the people who are going to see the advantage of it. So they're going to incorporate it in their practice and in, in the patient journey, basically, right. They're going to see the advantages. So, um, and people are going to hate it if they just think about it, the video call and my reimbursement. The people who are going to love it are going to say like, hey, I'm going to build this virtual side of my business and it's going to make my business or my practice way, a way better experience for patients because patients don't have to fill out paperwork anymore. They don't, it's just not a pain anymore to call the practice. And if I do a video call, for example, it's just going to be part of the patient journey so that the patient has a better experience. That these are going to be the winners again, or I don't know a better terminology. And these are the ones who are going to love it. So um, another thing that I thought about too, like they probably could get more patients in too, right? And yes. they don't have to hire, which is also bad because technology is going to replace human workers, but they won't have to pay for other medical uh, assistance. Uh, yeah. Right. And they probably could just go bang, 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 like call, call, call. So uh, another question is there is uh, actually somebody on this call right now uh, who thank you for joining. I'm not going to mention your name, who is a doctor who is an ama probably one of the best doctors in the world, uh, uh, has written many papers, really admirable. However, she lives in another state. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, she's technically not allowed to work with me because of you know, regulations or whatever. Uh, different laws, different rules among different states, and even like different countries in the world. 
Do you think that there will be a trend where we'll be able to have medical practitioners from other areas of the world? That's such an interesting uh, idea because I think the technology is not the limiting factor here, nor is the knowledge of the medical provider. The limiting factor for this is regulation, right? And that's, that's even true for the United States from state to state because I need to have a license in that state and I also need to be credentialed in that state in order to receive reimbursement. So that becomes even more complicated if you're like in different countries of the world, because then, you know, you're not even allowed to practice any medicine if it's a, if it's a, if it's a doctor um, in, from Germany cannot treat a patient uh, uh, that is based in, in the United States. So unless I don't they fly to see them, right? Because, you know, if you want to see, you know, people fly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, unless they're licensed and credentialed in the United States, that's, that's basically it. Yeah. Um, so it's hard to say for me. Um, I do think that um, there is already um, like medicine, like patients are coming to the U S to get treated. Right. So this is already, there's already like patient tourism happening. So why would it not happen to a certain degree also for telemedicine? And again, like if you think about it, the patient then still needs to go to that doctor in person. The question where it becomes really interesting, where it doesn't need to happen, like for example, mental health. Um, you know, like there's a lot of um, immigrants in the United States, myself included. Why would I pay for the mental health professional that is costing me? 3x to what like a mental health professional is costing me in Germany some, somewhere. I'm just using a, a very simple example. So there it becomes um, very much a threat, I think, for the existing physicians in a specific country. But I don't think you can stop that. I think this will happen. And it's already happening now because I can just do a FaceTime with a mental health professional from that, okay. it, you know. All right. Well, that, that's great. Okay. So Simon, um, I, I, I'm going to do one uh, thing uh, with the community here. I hope you're mm -hmm. all excited. Uh, first of all, for the next couple minutes, and we're going to have, if we're going to, we might have, depending on time, a few minutes at the end for Q and A. Uh, so please stay on. And if anybody wants to ask Simon a question, uh, just put it in chat. And uh, I am excited to experiment with this. So uh, let's go here. Okay. So we're gonna do a Zeitgei cultural exercise, all right? So Simon, you're an example. Clara's an example of, uh, everybody could see this, right? Simon, you could see this? Yeah, this cultural exercise. Uh, I just wanna go back to the financial crisis, okay? There are a list of companies that started and see how successful they are right now. They saw an opportunity space. Airbnb, Uber, WhatsApp, Slack, Square, Groupon. Now, many of them you know, aren't that accessible right now because of the situation that we're in right now, but they saw the white space in the same way that you had seen the white space, the opportunity set. And then there are other companies that actually started in 2006, 2007, that actually also, you know, survived like yours through the financial crisis, which is probably the last, you know, crisis that we've had as uh, a, a global, a, a world uh, connected together. Spotify, Dropbox, Twitter, Tom's, Wix, and BuzzFeed actually began their companies in 2006, 2007, like you. So I ask everybody on this phone or on this Zoom call to actually just take a couple minutes uh, and I would love you to imagine a post-corona world and come up with an idea. Don't spend too much time thinking about it. Just, I'm sure you've thought about this or may, or if you need more time, you could do it after you get off this call, but come up with an idea of a new business product service or global issue remedy that could succeed in a new world. There are no bad ideas. So uh, spend the next couple of minutes, it's three minutes, and then actually I'm gonna have an experiment where you're gonna get a partner uh, virtually uh, matched up automatically because of technology that I'm learning, and you're gonna share that idea with the person um, who's coming from all around the world. So here we go. Spend the next three minutes thinking about 
what the idea is. What's the next telemedicine? Raindrops are falling on my head And just like the guy whose feet are too big for his bed Nothing seems to fit Those raindrops are falling on my head They keep falling So I just did me